Good afternoon. Um, the subject of my talk that had been decided uh, by some time ago, you could see there, it's about AI, it's about uh, imbalance, uh, of, uh, balance and imbalance of power. Um, I'm a little bit troubled now because I just, my instincts, I want to follow up what has been said here. I can add something, just, you know, it's the first hand expertise. Uh, but let me stick to the original topic. And at the end, because I'll, I'm talking about human decisions. And uh, at the end, I'll probably reserve a few minutes to um, revisit these issues. Um, so um, um, it's, uh, um, you know, when we talk about humans and machines, so I think it's, this, 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 it's very important to demystify the subject. Because this, many of us, maybe not in this room, but many of us as, as, as humans, we have been, let's say, brainwashed by Hollywood and by images, so about uh, um, dystopian future, and about machines taking over, dominating our lives. So I never understood why S S Skynet wanted to kill all the humans, but you know, that's, it, it, it has an impact. And uh, we, you know, we have to make sure that you know, we, we understand, so we, can, we separate things. From, Sci-fi from reality, because at the end of the day, so it's the uh, AI is not a harbinger of utopia or dystopia. It's not a magic wand, but it's not a terminator. It's a tool created by us humans. So that's why it's very important to remember that whatever we do, it's you know it's still on us. So and um, and I will, since I mentioned. Uh, um, uh, sci-fi and Hollywood, so I want to use this image from one of the recent Star Wars movies uh, from series, uh, Mandalorian 2, actually, to, to kick off this, this conversation. So, uh, Mandalorian, Dro droids are not good or bad, they're neutral reflections of those who program them. That says, says everything. So, they're not... Uh, so it it's brings us back to us. So who we are and how we make these decisions and how these decisions impact our world. And, uh, and I will, throughout my presentation, I'll try to stick to this main idea. So it's about us humans. And humans always stay in the center of this, of this uh, process. Um, but uh, from distant future, I want us to go back to the, to the past because I have my own experience of working actually for competing with computers. Uh, and the story actually started before these famous matches with IBM Deep Blue. Um, the picture you see just behind me, it uh, uh, was made in Hamburg in June 1985. Uh, I was um, on my way to, to, to winning the title. I became the world champion. Uh, uh, later that, that, that year, and I played an, uh, what we call just simultaneous exhibition. Probably some of you know that this is it's a grandmaster, chess master go, is going around you know, making moves and uh, your opponents respond. The uniqueness of this event was that I played 32 computers. Oh, humans executed moves, but we had, I had computers suggesting the moves. Um, Maybe some of you still have these relics from the 80s. So there's some of these computers even carried my name. Um, and uh, I have to tell you, I won all the games. <laughs> there were 32 of them, and I won all the games. But it was not a surprise. The surprise would be exactly the opposite. If I would have lost or even drew one of the games. Because uh, machines, big deal. So it's just, it's just, it was more like you know, a nice toy. No, they could play some good chess. They could beat many decent players, but no match, of course, for, for a future world champion. And when I look at this picture, you know, it reminds me of the golden age of human-machine relations. Because machines were weak, but my hair was strong. <laughs> I have to also say that uh, the idea of um, beating human world champion was in, in the minds of the founding fathers of com 
compute, compute, computing science from the from very early days. All of them, Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, Norbert Wiener, they all thought that chess could be an ultimate test for machine intelligence. But because they had no access to this immense computing power, they thought that eventually the day would come when machines could emulate the way we think. That was, that was an idea. Um, you could not blame them because, again, they had no access to computing power. They have been operating with this, you know, this, okay, I don't know whether, whether it's ENIACs or machines in the 50s, you know, they, they, they can be con considered as serious devices, not even by today's standards, by the standards of the 80s or 90s. And, and um, so the dream came true in 1997. Uh, that's the picture of the match. I faced only one computer, IBM Deep Blue, of course, for, for, for the record. Historical record, of course. I should say that I beat machine a year earlier, in 1996, in Philadelphia. Just you know, to make sure that this, this is, it was not a match, but a rematch. Um, <laughs> and many today, just it, it's, it's being repeated. Many today say, oh, this is, that was a dawn of artificial intelligence. You know, that's the, the machine was smart. It could play chess. Let me tell you. This machine was as intelligent as your alarm clock. <laughs> a very expensive one, $10 million dollars a piece, but still, it was not intelligent at all. And you, I can tell you, it didn't have to be intelligent. Because what we want from, the, from our machines is not to solve the game, solve all the problems. There is no perfection in this universe. What we want from them is to make fewer mistakes to do better. That's exactly where the founding fathers of computer science were wrong. Because they thought, oh, we couldn't solve the game of chess. They were right. According to Lord Shannon, the number of legal moves in the game of chess is 10 to the 46 power. Unsolvable for any computer in this known universe. But at the end of the day, even the best humans make mistakes. And all we want from our machines, whether it's a chess playing computer or a driver's car, we want to reduce the number of mistakes. I think that's one of the biggest problems we, we are experiencing now while we're talking about AI. Ah, driver's car had an accident. Yeah, absolutely. It will have made more than one accident. The problem is this accident makes it the front page of the newspaper. The fact is that about 40,000 people being killed every year because of human mistakes on, on the roads in this country, statistics. So, um, going back to this match, so I, yeah, I lost the match, I um, lost it because machine played well, no. Today, if you have a chess app on your device, it's stronger than the blue. And of course, if you can download a chess engine on your laptop, it's just, there's no, no match to the blue. It just, all these engines will show you within a few seconds that both Gary Kasparov, world champion at the time, and the Blue played, eh, not lousy chess, but you can definitely make improvements. By the way, in 1997, everybody thought we played great chess. Things getting better. Yeah. And uh, when I, when the match was finished, and I, of course, I, I was, I was devastated. It's actually not just because I lost the match to a computer, because it was the first match I lost, period. It was very hard. Um, of course, I wanted to play the re-rematch, re re and IBM made a, by the way, a good decision not to, not to play again. It, I was very upset about it, uh, because I, I believe they owned me the rematch, but again, yeah, Lou Gerstner made the right decision. So they knew that at that time, they were not dominant yet. And so the, the re rematch could end negatively. So again, from PR perspectives, they were, they were right. Bad for science, bad for, for humanity, but... Now, people ask me about the competition, because that's something well, that's what attracts us. Uh, it's uh, how can we compete with machines? That was a big question then, still it's being asked. And I can tell you, the competition was over ages ago, ages, nearly 20 years ago. 
I played, by the way, a couple more matches with strong engines. One was Israeli, one was German. Both ended as a tie. But I knew that it was one-way street. It's like, you know, just having the you know, just sign on the wall. Yeah, we could play for a few more years, but that's, that's, that's a typical cycle. In the beginning, we think machines, eh, they're toys. Then they can play as the machine, the simultaneous exhibition you saw. It's, it's an interesting competition, so, but we're still superior. Then there's a very short period. It's like, you know, like a dot on the timeline. So where, where we can compete, and it's interesting. Then, and by the way, this is a very short period. And then machines are much better ever after. So today, if you have this, this uh, the one, the engine I mentioned that is downloaded on your, on your laptop, and look at Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion, the difference is about the same as between Usain Bolt and Ferrari. No, you can compete for 50 meters. Then I guess Ferrari takes the lead. <laughs> Uh, but, um, so, but now, what, what, is, what, what could you learn from that? And it's, it's, it's actually, this is the, as I said, machine was not intelligent because it was still taught by humans. And there were other games. And I just wanted just to take a little bit of time now just to be, just make it more scientific because it's, since I'm being asked about Alpha Zero, this, this is, this, this, I couldn't escape this question. I decided to take a few more minutes, actually, and to show uh, you know, the, the progress uh, made by humans and made by computers. Because there's a big confusion about alpha zero, the algorithm. This is now as close as we can get to independent thinking for machine. And let me just explain why. Because it's not just Go, it's not chess, it's, it's, it's a whole algorithm. So what do you see here on this, on this uh, diagram is that you see the progress made by humans. You know, Robert Fisher, Gary Kasparov, Magnus Carlsen. That's linear for more than half a century. And this is the progress by computers. Now, and you can see this, machines are getting stronger, 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 and that's you see this big leap forward. So what is alpha zero as a con concept? So after chess was quote unquote solved, the, computer, the experts looked at other games. And the natural choice was Go, because Go is mathematically more complex. And this is, they're not the same patterns. So that's this. And um, the team from DeepMind, run by Demis Kasabis, by the way, used, used to be a very good player when I was a kid. So uh, they came up with a program that beat top Go players, very convincingly. They played these this, this games, and everybody was surprised by the, by the moves. By that that that, uh, uh, that computer made it was something phenomenal. So there was really big excitement, um, and then they decided to make an experiment, which I think it's a historic experiment. They said, "Look, it's an interesting story, but we taught this program to play chair uh, go based on on our knowledge of the game. What about giving machine only the rules, just the rules, nothing else?" and let machine play millions and millions of games against itself and to learn patterns independently from humans. And then they had this machine that had zero human intervention with a machine that was taught by humans, same algorithm, and they played a match, 100 games. You know the score? 100 to nothing. The machine was without human Liabilities, quote unquote, one. So um, I spoke to them, to the team, and to Demis, who's a good friend, and uh, I said, look, you know, the problem with Go is that the game is underdeveloped compared to chess. In chess, we know much more about the game. So why don't we just, you know, we make this experiment in chess? So, uh, because we have so much knowledge. So the, if you look at the Go, is, Go is probably at the level where chess was a couple hundred years ago. So we have so much knowledge. Let's see if this knowledge is not sufficient enough uh, uh, for machine that will, will be taught by humans to fight alpha, alpha zero mechanism. Because I say alpha zero could be in chess, in Go, it's, just, it's, it's, it's an idea that starts from the scratch. They did it. They had uh, alpha zero, 
played 60 million games in four and a half hours, had its own patterns, uh, ideas, and they played against some of the strongest chess engines that were rated about 3,400. So it was one-sided. Not that bad, but the first match against uh, Stockfish program was 28 wins for Alpha Zero, 72 draws, not a single loss. What is more interesting, so we discovered that our, like a conventional wisdom from professionals about the future development of the game based on our understanding. If you have a machine playing chess, it will be more solid, like, you know, trench war. Because they, they don't blunder machines. They just, they, they don't sacrifice material. No, actually, Alpha Zero played, I was very pleased because I'm a very aggressive player, so played very aggressive dynamic chess. But when they say sacrifice, this is, it's the wrong word, because we always have a, a, t a tendency to apply human terms to machines. Machines do not sacrifice, it's an exchange. Because AlphaZero created a, a system of balances and imbalances that worked very much, you know, just it's, uh, was very much superior to what was uh, done by traditional, traditional computers. And, uh, um, and then it's just the question is, so did it mean that, you know, we're out of business? So why do we need Alpha zero, so we didn't ask if you have alpha zero mechanism and it could do better without, not so fast. And here is just a very important uh, um, uh, shtick that changes actually the equation. Alpha zero has a fundamental weakness and it's, it can be discovered only when you have a human eye and it's, it played 60 million games, it could be like 100 million games. It establishes its patterns and they're all based on numbers. Now, but what if some of these evaluations are wrong? Uh, some of these imbalances are not perfect. As for instance, the evaluation of bishop and knight, for instance, it, it gives much bigger advantage to bishop that it, it's, you know, it should, because of the number of, in, in, in the 60 million games, it sees, it sees this pattern. And what if I work with a computer competing against alpha zero, and what if I try to use these disadvantages because I know the, the Achilles heel. And if I win one game, if not to win, this combination human machine wins one game or two games, how many games will it take for alpha zero to see that this imbalance is wrong? Hundreds of thousands of games. It cannot do it on its own because it's about, it's about numbers. So to, to counter 60 million or so games, you need hundreds of thousands of losses. That's exactly where we're coming. We can make a tweak. And that you know, just uh, brings me to my next slide. That's what happened you know, next year after losing to, to uh, the blue. So I guess I was licking my wounds. And I thought, why not to bring us together? You cannot beat them, join them. So that's how I came up with a concept I call advanced chess, human intuition and experience, machine speed and analysis. What we found out, because we had so many experiments, so many matches played, mostly on the internet, is that the key element in this uh, combination is not human talent or machine speed, but superior process, interface. A weaker player with a slower computer can beat a stronger player with more powerful machine if he or she knows how to get the best out of it. Because that's a that's, that's simple formula. How close you can get to 100% with humans and machines. And human factor becomes important. Again, you, could be different tasks. And we should know exactly what this machine needs for this task and what is missing. What, what kind of human contribution is needed. Because sometimes, you know, you just have to let machine run it to understand that, you know, 95% or more machine can do better than us. But there's no tragedy of us, you know, belonging to last few decimal places as long as we know how to get the best out of this combination. So uh, that's, you know, the little cycle. So I just wanted to, to show. So we start brute force machines follow our instructions. So and then we have smarter machines. That's, that's like an advanced chess partner with experts. They use superior processes, that's the key. And then you move to something like Alpha Zero, that's the future. By the way, still most of the compute, 99% of the industry still operates in these first two. This is, that's, it's still, you know, 
future, maybe not distant future, but still a future. And something that I always suggest when we say AI, don't say artificial intelligence, say augmented intelligence, for two reasons. One is, it sounds friendlier. This is our way to, to, to counter the Hollywood brainwashing propaganda. It's not alien. It's not threatening us. But also, it's a more precise way to describe human-machine co collaboration. This is yes, how we work together. It's augmented intelligence. So again, this, and I use a telescope because telescope is it's, it's a device that can enhance our vision. So machines in the past made us stronger. They made us, made us faster. Intelligent machines should make us smarter. Yeah, it's a bit unpleasant that you know machines are now challenging like, the sacred area. So for us, our, our brains, you know, again, let's be practical. You know, if we know how to use them, they'll make us smarter. But the key is, as was that, why, why I put telescope there, depends where you put it. If you put telescope to the ground, you'll not see anything but dirt. You have to aim to the stars. So again, it depends on us. So how we, how we locate these, these, these devices. It's, so it's the, when we talk about, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, I mean, it's one of the uh, uh, analogies you can, Imagine this is a very powerful rifle that can shoot you know, a few miles. And uh, all you can do is just to change the direction of the bullet in the barrel for a millimeter. But the difference, mile or two, will be 10 meters or more. So that's, the, that's again, that's our role. Do not be upset that we can do little in the process of decision making. It's not about the process, it's about the impact. An impact can be really huge. So now, let's talk about military because that's practical uh, uh, applications. Um, so we can process information at a very high speed. So we can crunch the data. But the problem is how we, do it, how we understand it and how we apply it. And then here we have one of the key imbalances. It's a bottleneck. So this is the, it's the, the speed of the information, the, the crunching of data, and then the decisions that we have to make based on it. And uh, again, that's for us, for humans, to actually to do free this bottle, that bottleneck. That's, that's, that's absolute key. So, um, and uh, that's one of, the, one of the big issues, yeah, that's we, big challenges that we, we are dealing with. And, um, and uh, now let's, this is, uh, it's a quote from a book, uh, Eric Topol. Uh, recently he became uh, a big expert on Twitter on, uh, uh, on COVID. But he wrote the book where he just, you know, he talked a lot about this human plus machine collaboration and about the importance of human element of, of this, of this uh, uh, combination. So, and, uh, um, uh, so he found, by following this formula, they found uh, applications in medicine, they found that in many cases, it was correct. So it's, it's not about having the best expert, a professor, uh, or the best technology, but it's about having the ideal combination. Because sometimes, you know, being a top expert, you know, could, could uh, blur your, your vision, because you don't want to concede some territory to the machine. Ah, uh, I know better. No, no, you should, you know, sometimes I'd rather have, you know, an experienced nurse than a top professor. You know, reading, reading the, uh, um, uh, the, what's the, the data that's, that is uh, produced by, by a machine. So uh, again, that's, uh, that's, that's a trend. That's a trend that we, uh, I think we, we all are gradually accepting, though again, it's, this, it's the, uh, uh, the technological factor still, you know, still dominates uh, our minds. And, um, and sometimes, you know, when you don't know how to um, um, address the issue, so that as you, you we are perplexed by some of the scientific mysteries, you'd better you look for the answer in the art. So it sounds quite a par as a paradox, quite odd, but actually that's true, because answers they are at the end, questions are the beginning, and that's exactly what only humans can do. No, no, of course machines can ask questions. They just don't know what questions are relevant. So because we humans, we know what matters most. 
And uh, that's, you know, that's a very important lesson for us to, 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 to remember. Uh, again, Picasso had no ideas about computers, but instinctively, he gave us, the, gave us the right piece of advice, piece of wisdom that helps us to move forward. And uh, since I found that many it says in my audience uh, were skeptical about Picasso, what the, what the heck he knew about computers, so I found someone who was more experienced uh, and had just, you know, let's say, better credit history in talking about, about machines and said something quite similar. Joseph Weizenbaum, not the biggest name in, in, in just for the general public, there were, he was the, one of the founding fathers, pioneer of, of AI, uh, who had this uh, um, famous program called ELISA. It's a Siri prototype all the way back in 1964. Just, you know, the program could talk and just, you know, emulate human therapy by back in 1964. Now, that's a, that's a, it's a great book, Computer Power and Human Reason. And he talked, in 1976, nobody paid attention to that. But today, I think that's the big lesson. Deciding and choosing. Deciding is computational. And if you ask computer, so why did you do that? You can go down, 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 down the tree, because I was told so. You ask human, because I want it. We humans, we, we make decisions based on well, whatever. Sometimes it's moral, sometimes it's selfish. But this, and again, while it's this, the, the difference is so subtle, but it's absolutely fundamental. And uh, I think recognizing it you know, just, it's, will give us a better idea. So how to move forward. And uh, that's, now it's, it's time to talk about, you know, this is this, this combination, humans and, and machines. And I think the race for the future, it's, uh, it's not it's for, for this superiority, for, for the dominance in AI. It should become the race about human superiority because the human component is the key one. And, uh, um, and I think we should also recognize that a very important element of, of the success in this combination is freedom. It's the key factor that decides the balance of power. I grew up in the Soviet Union. Yeah, the country had its technology, had chess world champions, had science. But it lost to the United States and to the free world because it didn't have freedom. I remember back in 1984 when we just first time saw a fax machine. One of my friends, computer expert, who actually became you know, very successful later on moving to America, he told me, Gary, just looking at this fax machine, probably I had one of the first in the Soviet Union. Uh, the communism is dead because the slaves cannot build powerful computers. And, uh, and so the Soviet Union lost. Because all oh, this is a so super powerful industrial machine, lost competition to kids in the garage. And uh, American innovation won. Also, it's, it's not just the freedom to compete, to innovate, but it's also freedom to fail. This is something that dictatorships cannot afford because they have to control the outcome. Oh, we're happy to have 100 startups, but we have to know exactly which one is Google. Uh, sorry, it doesn't work this way. And, uh, and since you know, we, just, uh, we live at a time where just, you know, it's, it's even talking about AI and about, uh, 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 and about uh, cybersecurity, so it's hard to avoid the current events. Um, I have to add something, just to follow Condi. I probably disagree with you about Putin's miscalculations, because unfortunately, I think he calculated many things. You know, he's very, he's a ruthless man, just, you know, cold-minded. What he couldn't calculate is the fact that Ukrainians are free people. What he couldn't calculate that let me be diplomatic. The cowardice of uh, many foreign Western leaders 
and the favorite disguise of prudence will be overruled by public outrage. Again, I'm trying to be very diplomatic. I could say things in a much more direct way. <laughs> he couldn't have figured it out. He believed, after so many years of paying no consequences for his crimes, that he could get away with this as well. Germans in the pocket, Nord Stream 2 is there. By the administration, okay, we had so many meetings, and uh, they wanted me in the Iranian deal, they wanted me in a Green New Deal, so the, yeah, okay, fine. It's, and by the way, US intelligence was correct, but they also repeated the same mistakes as Russians. Do well, remember, US intelligence predicted the Kyiv would fall in four days, in 96 hours. It seems they, they, get, they were getting, that proves to me that they got information from Russians, because they made the same mistake. <laughs> It was a good intelligence. But they failed. And uh, what was the turning point of this war? It's the heroism of the whole nation and the one man, a comedian, who was elected by 72% of people. And we said, oh, Ukrainians, they got crazy. They elected a comedian. We live in a very peculiar time where many politicians turn to be clowns. And comedian has become a hero. <laughs> and, and many, and, and many of, of, of these phrases, spontaneous phrases, I think they'll end up in history next to Winston Churchill's quotes, like answering Americans' polite uh, uh, suggestion to evacuate him, I do not need the right, I need ammunition. So he stayed there, Ukrainians fought back, and that's changed everything. Yes, Germany changed its policy over, overnight. And who did it? The man in the gray suit, Olaf Scholz, without due respect, he didn't have charisma of Gerhard Schroeder, Angela Merkel, but he, he could look at the polls. All of a sudden, Germans saw these, the Russian bombs, the Russian missiles, and they, I think it was kind of, you know, just genetic memory. Maybe it was a relief for Germany. We're no longer bad guys. Actually, the, the Nazis now on the other side. <laughs> and with 90% support for Ukraine, Germany became a leader. By the way, if you just want to look at the list of sanctions and supply to Ukraine, I have bad news for you. America is almost at the bottom of the list. We're doing the tracker. We look at every element of the big promises, belligerent speeches. Not so much in action. Yes, America could do a lot, but there's still reservations. And that's a problem. Because with all, you know, respect to Germany and other European countries, without American leadership, nothing happens in this, in, in, in this world yet. Maybe Europeans will change. Though Macron spends probably every day talking to Putin. I don't know what kind of psychological uh, trap it is, but he keeps talking, oh, like I said, to keep contacts open. And I, now I agree with, with, with Condi, she said, this. after three or four days, after failing, taking over Kyiv, and by the way, Putin believed, I'm in Kyiv, I have a puppet, Yanukovych, maybe just a government, and everybody will come back to the negotiating table. Oh, we'll have Americans, Germans, yeah, we have to save something, you know, look, you know, but, and I will be king, king of, just, it's, it's, uh, of the game. Now, he's not in Kyiv, and uh, he's, he's stuck, and now, he couldn't agree more, he's intentionally shooting civilians. He couldn't conquer them. He wants to bombard them into submission. By the way, that's not first time. Grozny, 2000, Aleppo, 2015. It's not surprising that many Russian commanders there, they came from Syria. There's one problem. In Syria, they could bomb civilians with almost no risk of retaliation. In Ukraine, not so much. Six Russian generals have been killed, actually, five, six already. Six Russian generals, that's more than they lost in 10 years in Afghanistan. Uh, by the way, that tells you, that's exactly as, as, as was said here a few minutes ago, that they don't have the core structure. So that's why they have many generals and top officers, uh, senior officers in the field, because they have to compensate for, for this poor command structure. Why this structure is poor? Going back to the same question, freedom. If whole country is corrupt, if corruption is endemic, don't you think that the army has the same problem? Yes, they spend billions and billions and bi I mean, endless uh, billions of dollars. 
By the way, during the last 10 years, Vladimir Putin has been spending more and more money on, on military, security, police, and propaganda. At the same time, cutting expenses in his budget on social security, housing, uh, education, culture, healthcare. If this was not a military budget, what was that? So, and uh, um, I wrote a book, Winter's Coming, why Vladimir Putin and the enemies of the free world must be stopped back in 2015. Um, was mixed reception of the book. Now it's, uh, it's run, often it's, it's running on Amazon as number one in current affairs. <laughs> That's bad news. <laughs> And people ask me, why, you know, why, how could you predict that? I said, because I was listening to Vladimir Putin. I grew up in the Soviet Union. And when I heard KGB Lieutenant Colonel talking about uh, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Once KGB, always KGB. The no former KGB officers. That's his, those his words. You know, I believed him. Unfortunately, not many people on the other side believed him. So that's why for me it was clear. It's not if Putin would attack Ukraine, but when? And he did. By the way, he did it. We should give him credit. He did it in plain sight. He even brought his Pacific fleet to the Black Sea. Did you think that you bring this fleet from one side of the world to another uh, uh, to just to negotiate? And again, he made this mistake. And this mistake made by, uh, by all dictators in the past. And that's why, again, it's just bring, going back to, to the topic of our conversation now. It's the, the freedom is a decisive factor. And uh, it's not only Putin. You can look at Chinese. Uh, people talk about the future. And by the way, speaking about this cooperation, again, I couldn't agree uh, with Kony Moore. It's, it's Putin, is, Putin is not comfortable playing a second fiddle. Yeah, it's uh, about Chinese tune. Because you know, China looks at Putin with, I would say, with skepticism. But it's, it's, he's expandable. They never recognized Crimea, by the way, never. They uh, never offered Putin any support. Now, of course, they would be happy for him winning because they could actually look at Taiwan that's, uh, with great appetite. But now they're measuring the, the effect of the sanctions, and they see well, what happens, how it's working. So, and Chinese allies, like Kazakhstan, for instance, they all behave the same way. This is the Chinese-controlled universe is very cautious. They're not blaming Putin, but they're not supporting him. Because, as we know, when dictator is losing the war, nobody wants to be next to him. So, um, and uh, um, also, speaking about the Chinese and AI, because that's a big question, of course. So can we compete with them? Not that we can, we must, and not only compete, but we must win, and we will. Because it's not about collecting data. It's not about having faster machines. Naturally, you know, this is the, our advantage in, in having faster machines is always short-lived. We can lead by relying on faster computers for a while. But at the end of the day, it's about, it's about this component. It's, it's about free minds. And um, recently, we had the best proof, COVID-19. A communist Chinese dictatorship gave the world COVID. I'm not here to debate, you know, the lapse or what, but it's, it was cover-up, massive cover-up and cruelty. And American innovation, free minds, free competition, full of immigrants, gave the world the vaccine. That's an answer about the future. The freedom is a key component. And uh, I believe that all these imbalances, they will end up eventually with, with freedom. And, uh, just to end on a positive note, so again, I have a, a violent agreement with, with Condi about the outcome of the war. Ukraine must win. Because it's not a war about Ukrainian territorial integrity. This is not just a war about Ukrainian sovereignty. This is not just a war about eastern flank of NATO. This is not just a war about NATO as a whole. This is a war about the future. And Vladimir Putin represents forces that believe that the future should be different. Basically, not the future, but the past. He looks in the past with great admiration. Joseph Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, 
Why? Because they could be above the law. While we're talking about nuances, subtle differences here, Vladimir Putin wants the world where the strongest is dominant. And it's not his ability to control his own people and the other countries is not limited by anything but, but, but sheer force. We want to move in the opposite direction. And that's why the positive scenario for me as, as a Russian, and I can tell you that every day I do at least one interview with Ukrainians. I cannot say no. And though I, I cannot blame myself for offering Vladimir Putin on ounce of support for the last 22 years, I probably he's the staunchest critic, I still feel ashamed. Because on behalf of my country, the unspeakable crimes being committed. We are witnessing war crimes on an industrial scale. And uh, I cannot stop that. But I know that the only future is for Ukraine to win. And the Ukrainian victory, which by the way for me is not limited by, by the return to the demarcation line of February 24th. But for me, the victory is the Ukrainian flag raised in Sevastopol. It's restoring historical justice, and that will lead to a revolt in Russia. Again, same, same argument. The Tsars cannot afford losing wars. And then, by the way, then we'll, then we'll talk about palace coup. Because the moment he's weak, the moment he's running out of funds, to, to, to pay for his police and propaganda, we can expect for, for a better outcome. But in the meantime, so again, we should, uh, we should continue doing what I've been doing best. So encouraging uh, free people to uh, compete freely, to innovate, fail, fall, rise. And I, as an incorrigible optimist by nature, I believe that future belongs to us. Thank you.